Pope Benedict XVI, successor to the much-loved John Paul II. Benedict's election was as unlikely as it was inevitable. I was quite sure that they would not elect him because he was German, because of the history of the war, because uh, of that he was participating in Hitler's army. As a cardinal, he was a strict conservative. He had this reputation as the doctrinal enforcer. His views were in line with those of Pope John Paul II, and the Pope came to rely on him. Cardinal Ratzinger's role was that he was an intimate. They got along, they trusted each other. And when the beloved Pope died, the job fell to him. They were enormous shoes to fill. All Joseph Ratzinger, the Cardinal, wanted to do was go back and write his books of theology. Suddenly, John Paul II dies. You go into the Sistine Chapel on a Sunday, and on a Monday, you're the Pope. And as Pope, he has caused controversy. Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman. Such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Despite his missteps, he could still attract an audience. One of the differences between the people who come to see Pope Benedict and the people who came to see John Paul, um, particularly towards the end, was that uh, many people came to see John Paul, whereas now people come to listen to Benedict. The oldest pope elected since Clement XII in 1730. It even surprised him. I had truly believed that I had finished my life work and that I could look forward to a quiet end to my life. And so it was with genuine conviction that I said to the Lord, please don't let it be me. As Pope, he has attempted to restore the Church's tarnished image. If I read the histories of these popes, these victims, it's difficult for me to understand how it was possible that priests betrayed in this way their mission to give healing, to give love of the God to these children. And travel around the world hoping to renew the faith of Catholics everywhere. It was easy to know the doctrine. It's much harder to help a billion people live it. But before he could achieve those lofty goals, Pope Benedict shocked the world by resigning. With an often scandalous eight-year term behind him, Pope Benedict was free to enjoy life beyond the papacy. On April 19, 2005, the eyes of the world were on Rome. More than 100,000 of the faithful waited anxiously in St. Peter's Square to witness the announcement of the new pope, the successor to Pope John Paul II. I was praying, I remember, at a certain point, the telephone went whoop, whoop, because I took off the volume, but whoop, whoop, white holy smoke. And so we ran, I ran, I was with my cousin and another friend, uh, you know, when we have a new pope, Romans run. And then, shortly before 6 p.m., the waiting was finally over. Sancte Romane Ecclesiae Cardinalem The crowd in St. Peter's Square broke out cheering. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger from Germany was named pope. He took the name Benedict XVI. The cardinals have elected me, a simple, humble worker in the vineyard of the Lord. When it became a little bit clear that Ratzinger would be elected pope, uh, I knew that many Catholics in Germany or all over the world will say, oh God, Ratzinger, it's terrible. I was quite sure that they would not elect him because he was German, because of the history of the war, because uh, of, that he was participating in Hitler's army. From the Hitler Youth Movement to Pope, that was the recurring headline the day after the election. The British press in particular accused Ratzinger of not having distanced himself clearly from National Socialism during World War II. A few journalists even claimed that Ratzinger secretly sympathized with Hitler. 
Of course, he was a young boy and he was, uh, as every other young boy, meant to wear certain uh, clothes at that time and uh, participate in certain gatherings. But I believe, and he wrote it himself, that his conversion and big decision in becoming a priest, I believe it's because of the Nazi time. What's more important about Benedict's wartime service, about Joseph Ratzinger's wartime service, is what he took away from that experience, what it meant for the rest of his life. Ratzinger's election was controversial, not only because of his association with the Third Reich, but because of his reputation as a conservative hardliner among modern Catholics. As prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, he acted as the Vatican's doctrinal watchdog and earned the nickname God's Rottweiler. As head of the Holy Office, Cardinal Ratzinger basically had the worst job in Christendom. He was the guy who draws the lines in the sand. He's working at the behest of the Pope, in that case, Pope John Paul II. But he, in effect, in that job, was the bad cop to Pope John Paul II's good cop. The guy who has to fire people who do not behave well is not loved. Nobody likes somebody who has the, the simple job to, to throw out somebody who does not behave as he has to. For his strict doctrinal positions, he was called the Panzer Cardinal, the Enforcer, and Cardinal No, among other things. Nobody can be indifferent to negative comments on that scale or to the feelings of hatred and rejection. Nobody is unaffected by that sort of thing. But it was quite clear to him that it was his duty to see that the faith was not corrupted, adulterated or deformed. In September 2006, Ratzinger returned to his native Germany as Pope Benedict XVI. It was there while giving a talk at his old university in Regensburg where he would make one of his biggest blunders as Pope. It was September 12, 2006, the day after the fifth anniversary of the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center. Emotions were still raw when the Pope said, Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. The remark sparked outrage. The reaction from Muslims was instantaneous. Feeling Mohammed, the founder of their religion, had been slandered, they held angry and violent demonstrations. Benedict doesn't seem to have a diplomatic bone in his body. He wasn't going out there to offend, but that's certainly what he did. The Vatican tried through diplomacy to defuse the conflict. But it was not until the Pope traveled to Turkey at the end of November 2006 that he was able to dispel the last reservations. In a mosque in Istanbul, he demonstrated his respect for Islam by means of prayer. The great irony of the first couple of years of Benedict's pontificate is that his greatest controversy was not about the Catholic Church or within the Catholic Church, it was vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim community. Pope Benedict had clearly gone too far. The Catholic Church managed with difficulty to prevent an open dispute. The fact that he was so shocked and ambushed by the reaction, one day after 9-11, giving this, you know, citing this inflammatory anecdote, just gives you a sense of kind of how removed, in many respects, he is from the real world. As his papacy continued, Pope Benedict found himself leading a church that was in major crisis due to the sex abuse scandal, which his handling of was highly criticized, and the controversy surrounding the Vatican Bank and rumors about his declining health certainly didn't help matters. The Pope has caused a stir in a different sense, with his fashions. From his red leather loafers to his unusual hats, the Pope has made quite an impression. Some of these, these fashions that he's been wearing, I think, are interesting in the sense that he's really recycling papal fashions from centuries ago, like his ermine-trimmed red velvet cap that he sometimes wears, or even the shoes that he wears. These are things that, um, that were traditions of, of decades or even centuries ago among popes. In many ways, Pope Benedict XVI is an unlikely pope. 
His greatest ambition was to lead a classroom, but he ended up leading the Catholic Church instead. And after eight years of blood, sweat, and scandal, he became the first pontiff in nearly 600 years to resign. Pope Benedict XVI has come a long way from Mark to Lamb Inn, the small Bavarian town where he is from. He was born Joseph Ratzinger on April 16, 1927, in his family's home. It was Easter Saturday, and he was baptized that same evening. Joseph was the youngest of three children. His father, Joseph Ratzinger Sr., a police officer, and his mother, Maria Ratzinger, were deeply religious Catholics. His brother, Georg, a priest, remembers. Our father was stricter and more logical in his approach. Mother was more gentle and friendly. But Joseph Ratzinger was always a high achiever. At school, he was a good student. By 1939, the Ratzingers had moved to Tronstein, where young Joseph was enrolled at the boarding school of the archbishopric. The school was known for having many of its students go on to study theology and become priests. It seemed to be his destiny. But the landscape was changing in Germany. The National Socialists came to power and established the Third Reich. Membership in the Hitler Youth was compulsory. Ratzinger did not have Nazi sympathies. In fact, he and his family felt Nazism went against Catholic values. In 1941, Ratzinger was 14 years old when his cousin, also 14, a boy with Down syndrome, was killed by the Nazis as part of their campaign of eugenics. That same year, the young Ratzinger was forced to join the Hitler Youth. He was dragooned into the Hitler Youth, which was mandatory. He went to one meeting and then he got out of all the rest of them. Two years later, he was drafted as a helper for an anti-aircraft brigade and saw little action. In the spring of 1945, he deserted his unit and shortly afterwards was taken prisoner by American troops. We were both in the same situation. Everyone had stood under the same yoke and we were all threatened in the same way. And we all breathed a sigh of relief when the whole nightmare was over in May 1945. He came home from prisoner of war camp in June and I returned in July. In 1946, both brothers entered the seminary in Freising, near Munich, where they began to study theology. This was a natural fit for Ratzinger, and it was no surprise when on June 19, 1951, he and his brother were ordained as priests in Freising Cathedral. However, in 1952, Joseph Ratzinger resigned from his position as chaplain and returned to university his true love. The young theologian embarked on a meteoric academic career, completing his doctorate in 1953, state doctorate in 1957, and then taking academic posts at various universities. There cannot be many theologians who changed academic posts as often as Ratzinger did. People commented mockingly at the time that he would win the first prize amongst German dogmatists for his peripatetic lifestyle. Although many people may be surprised to hear this, Ratzinger has always been a very open man when it comes to engaging in dialogue. His students were always allowed to express their opinions freely. There was a real exchange of ideas. The young professor's reputation for promoting religious dialogue traveled as far as Rome. There, the Second Vatican Council met until 1965, under the leadership of Pope Paul VI. Bishops and cardinals from all over the world engaged in passionate discussions about reforms within the church. Joseph Ratzinger was a member of the German delegation. As a theological consultant to the council, Ratzinger advised Cardinal Joseph Frings of Cologne. Earlier, he had attracted attention for a number of comments which were as critical of Rome as they were modern. He seemed to be more liberal, but the word liberal is wrong. Uh, he really was against uh, regulations or rules. It was the upheavals in 1960, uh, student upheavals in the universities, uh, that made a conservative out of him. 1968 was a turning point in Ratzinger's life. He was a professor of dogmatic theology in the liberal university town of Tübingen when the student uprisings were happening. 
He felt Catholic values were being threatened as the peaceful protests quickly degenerated into violence. It was a time when students were questioning all forms of authority. They, in effect, broke the plane between the professors and students that used to exist. They broke the um, decorum that was there. Ratzinger is basically a very sensitive person. He tends to be rather reserved and doesn't attempt to dominate people physically. He lacks the stature for that. So instead, he tries to convince them by means of argumentation and reason. That proved impossible at that time. So he increasingly retreated into his shell. His innate reserve was strengthened by the experience, so that at times he often seemed to be cold. But he was very comfortable in his position as professor. In 1969, Professor Joseph Ratzinger moved from turbulent Tübingen to tranquil Regensburg. He was only 32 when a special chair for dogmatic theology was created for him. He achieved his life's dream. As one of the youngest professors in Germany, he had reached the highest position that it was possible for an academic to achieve. When he came to Regensburg, when he accepted the post at the university here, he thought that this would be his last post. That was why he built the house, which he intended to be his home for the rest of his life. But his life's work turned out to be very different from what he had envisioned for himself. Having achieved his dream of becoming a theology professor, Joseph Ratzinger settled down in Pentling, a village a few miles outside Regensburg. There he had a house and garden built. His sister, Maria, ran his household for him. In fact, she was his constant companion until her death in 1991. As a professor of theology, he led the quiet life of a scholar. He approached people in a friendly manner. Whenever he met people, especially neighbors, he would always greet them from afar as soon as he recognized them. He shook hands with everyone. The course of Joseph Ratzinger's life was about to change in ways he never imagined. In 1977, the theology professor was appointed Archbishop of Munich and Freising, now entrusted with the direction of the second largest diocese in Germany, responsible for almost two million Catholics. Joseph Ratzinger was forced to abandon his academic ambitions. Instead of focusing on his students, he was faced with the cares and worries of the congregation and argumentative priests. The 49-year-old theologian had very little experience in such matters. You can see it in this first month when he was elected, when he was appointed Bishop of Munich. You see that he really has difficulties to, to, to touch people, to talk to people, to, to have a dialogue with normal people. In October 1978, a new pope was named. Karol Wojtyła from Poland became the head of the Catholic Church and took the name John Paul II. Over the years, he had gotten to know and appreciate the German theologian, Archbishop Joseph Ratzinger. From the end of the 1970s, a friendship began to develop between these two very different men. Well, they always saw eye to eye on the need to defend the faith and, and to teach the Catholic faith uh, properly. They had this symbiotic relationship. Wojtyla, John Paul II, was a philosopher, uh, and uh, Joseph Ratzinger is a, a theologian. And so Wojtyla, as pope, needed someone like Ratzinger. John Paul II was not a world-class theologian. And Cardinal Ratzinger found little gray area in the Catholic doctrine, which made him a good candidate for the position to protect it. And in 1981, that is what he was asked to do. He received word from the Vatican that he was to resign from his position as bishop in Munich in order to become the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome, a job he did not ask for and didn't want. He had this kind of Bavarian soul for his whole time, for the whole time he worked here. Most of the cardinals who came to Rome changed the personality here, so they became more Italian. Cardinal Ratzinger was not like this. He was Bavarian even after more than 30 years here. Joseph Ratzinger, a true blue Bavarian, had difficulty adjusting to his new home. His new position as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, also known as the CDF, required him to spend more time in the public eye. He now shared the responsibility for the direction of the worldwide church. 
he doesn't seem to have any conflicts within him. He's very steady and very, uh, very cordial. I always get the feeling that I was speaking to, to someone who is, uh, who is naturally cordial and very, very respectful of other people without in an honest way. As prefect of the CDF, Joseph Ratzinger was responsible for preserving the purity of the Catholic doctrine. False doctrines are no longer fought with violence as they were in the Middle Ages. As prefect, Ratzinger issued prohibitions to those who published or taught such doctrines. It has always been straightforward. And when you are straightforward, you have a lot of friends, but also enemies. But I believe he had also a lot of respect worldwide. In fact, there are many philosophers, many theologists, even antagonists to him, that respect Joseph Ratzinger very much. In 1981, Ratzinger was already considered in some circles to be a conservative hardliner. He rejected the ordination of women and a more liberal approach to sexual morality. All those who demanded such changes encountered the opposition of Ratzinger. Because of this, Ratzinger was a constant target of the liberal media. He was seen as the enemy of modern Christians. He had this reputation as the doctrinal enforcer. I tend to think he enjoyed the job a bit too much, uh, and he is certainly a conservative. It was 24 years doing nothing else, just looking if another priest or another theologian would say something that was not correct in the Catholic, in the Catholic sense. And I think he didn't like this job after the first 10 years. As Cardinal Ratzinger approached his mid-70s, he attempted to retire several times, but Pope John Paul II refused to accept his resignation. At least twice he formally asked John Paul II if he could please retire. He was 78 years old at the time John Paul II died. Most cardinals have to retire at 75. Talking to him per privately, personally, he always said, I miss these forests, I love this German fresh air, I, I miss uh, Regensburg, I miss my hometowns, I miss Munich. To escape the strain of everyday life in Rome, he would return to his home in Bavaria. Here he could finally relax. Music was also a source of comfort and rejuvenation for the Cardinal. Music is very important for him, really. He, perhaps he's every day playing half an hour, piano and um, it is a little bit um, trip to the paradise for him to to be for half an hour in the paradise with the good music this really is for him very for the health of his soul very important in Rome Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger's influence was growing steadily he gradually had to take on more of the duties of Pope John Paul II who suffered from Parkinson's disease the symptoms made it increasingly difficult for the Pope to perform his duties to the fullest. Joseph Ratzinger, who by now had been his assistant for many years, tried to support him as much as possible. Cardinal Ratzinger's role was that he was an intimate. They got along, they trusted each other. I believe the relationship was described by John Paul II in his book, last book, saying he was the only cardinal he mentioned, the only friend was Joseph Ratzinger, my dearest friend, Joseph Ratzinger. It was a beautiful, incredible, long friendship, built on work, built on every day thinking and discussing the church, the universal church. And Joseph Ratzinger was there for his friend in difficult times. I saw Joseph Ratzinger coming to the hospitals, the, the Gemelli Hospital, where John Paul II stayed several times. And I knew that he came by night. And I know that it was very, very hard for him to go there, not because he was, didn't want to see the Pope. Obviously, he wanted to see the Pope, because he knew there were 500 journalists. And it was hard for Joseph Ratzinger to stop, to talk, to give interviews in this precise, really strange and really hard moment. And I think that he went, that he decided to go there was because he was really felt that he was losing a good friend. On April 2nd, 2005, life would change dramatically for Cardinal Ratzinger with the death of Pope John Paul II. Just six days later, Cardinal Ratzinger conducted the funeral ceremony, delivering the Requiem Mass before 3.5 million Christians in Rome. The beloved Polish Pope had led the church for more than 26 years. It was Joseph Ratzinger's duty to find the right words.
We can be sure that at this moment our beloved Pope is standing at the window of the house of the Lord, looking down on us and blessing us. Yes, he is. With these words, Joseph Ratzinger responded exactly to the mood in St. Peter's Square. He was a brilliant theologist, and everybody knew that. He was a brilliant professor, everybody knew that. But they, uh, they thought that he was cold, that he was not able to transmit warmness, heart. But in this precise moment, when he was celebrating the funeral of John Paul II, and when he said, the dead pope is now standing on the window of the home of God, and he's looking down to us on earth. I mean, everybody was crying this moment in front of St. Peter's. And I, was, and I saw the cardinals crying, and I was sure he won the elect elections in this moment. When he, when he showed one, one part of the personality, nobody ever would have thought that he had it. I don't think he wrote that speech to, you know, be elected, because I don't think he wanted to be elected. I, don't, I really don't think that he was campaigning to become pope. And I think he would have written the same speech if he were already, say, over 80 and not going to enter the conclave. The death of this beloved pontiff would forever change the life of Cardinal Ratzinger. The man who wanted nothing more than a quiet life in academia was now first in line to succeed John Paul. There hadn't been a German pope since the 16th century, but that was about to change. Pope John Paul II was one of the most beloved popes. With his death, the search for his successor began. The new pope was going to have very big shoes to fill. The conclave convened on April 18, 2005 behind closed doors. Only cardinals under the age of 80 could enter the conclave. There was plenty of speculation about the secret election. The 78-year-old Cardinal Ratzinger was considered a front runner. Talking to his driver, the Cardinal made it quite clear that he thought this speculation was nonsense. Then I asked him on the spur of the moment, what would happen if you were elected Pope? He seemed quite shocked and replied, no, Herr Kuhnel, I'm quite unsuited to this office. But not everyone agreed with this assessment. Many thought he had the necessary qualifications. There was the eloquence, there was the insider's know-how, uh, and there was the organizational ability. On April 19th, on the second day of voting, and after only four ballots, white smoke billowed from the chimney of the Sistine Chapel, signaling a new pope had been chosen. It was impossible that they had chosen somebody who was not one of the stars, somebody unknown. It was absolutely impossible, because to find a majority who would agree on a newcomer, you need a lot of elections. You don't need four, you need 20. So that means there was just one possibility. It must have been one of the real big stars. And I thought in this moment, okay, we'll be Ratzinger. The Cardinal Protodeacon, Jorge Medina Estevez of Chile, made the announcement. Sancte Romane Ecclesiae, Cardinale Ratzinger. While some 100,000 of the faithful anxiously awaited the appearance of their new pontiff, Inside, Joseph Ratzinger was facing a very secular, everyday problem. There were no suitable clothes for him to wear for his first appearance as Pope. Inside the Vatican, there was chaos. This is the one time when the Pope's official tailor, the Gamarelli brothers, the tailor shop in the center of, historic center of Rome, which has really been outfitting popes for about 200 years, this is the one time they get to shine because here they have a new pope who's going to be wearing their fashion, going out to meet the world in just a few minutes on the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica. So what they have to do is, of course, they have to bring a lot of pret-a-porter, ready to wear white cassocks with them. So they had to make some intelligent guesses. Unfortunately, they didn't guess right this time. So Joseph Ratzinger, now Benedict XVI, goes in there, and they're trying to fit him with a cassock and they can't find one that, that fits. And the poor tailors are just beside themselves. They're wondering, you know, we don't have a cassock, a white soutane that fits this guy. So he said, look, just give me anything white. After a considerable delay, Joseph Ratzinger appeared before the eager crowd for the first time as Pope Benedict XVI. There was no sign of the confusion or of the fact that the appearance was almost a catastrophe. 
The fact that the Lord can work and act even with insufficient means consoles me. And above all, I entrust myself to your prayer. With these first words, the new pope won a great deal of sympathy among the faithful. He knew that expectations were high as he followed in the footsteps of his charismatic predecessor, John Paul II. The cardinals didn't want a new pope. They wanted the dead pope back. They wanted to re-elect somebody who died. So they wanted another pope who was so close as possible to John Paul II. And there was no other guy who was so close as it was Joseph Ratzinger. While their conservative views were very similar, their personalities, at least their public personalities, could not be more different. Pope John Paul II, the most traveled pope in history, was always working the crowd, smiling, shaking hands, kissing babies. Pope Benedict XVI is more reserved and less eager to be the center of attention. Vivo Papa! Vivo Papa! Clearly now as Pope, we can't you know, take a walk around the neighborhood or go feed the cats or go buy the groceries or something like that that he used to do before. It was very touching to see him, how difficult it was for him to behave as Pope because it was, you know, he was shy and it was very hard for him. The first, I remember the first days when he tried to, to, to greet the people and he met just like this, but very shy. And now he's able to do like that, you know. With his election as Pope, Joseph Ratzinger was now the center of world interest. He dominated the headlines. In his native Germany, the biggest tabloid newspaper celebrated his election with a jubilant heading, We Are Pope. Church law forbids the cardinals who took part to tell anyone the details of the proceedings. However, Pope Benedict XVI gave a glimpse of how he had experienced the election. When it slowly became clear during the voting procedure that I was to be the one whose head was to land under the guillotine, I felt quite faint. I had truly believed that I had finished my life's work and that I could look forward to a quiet end to my life. And so it was with genuine conviction that I said to the Lord, please don't let it be me. You have younger, better candidates who could tackle this task with much more energy and strength than I. The day after the election, shadows of the past overtook the new pope. The British media in particular pressed the issue that the new pope was a former member of the Hitler Youth and a soldier in Hitler's army. These facts were already general knowledge, but nonetheless, they appeared again in numerous headlines. How do you react towards a lie? You may suffer a moment, but it's still a lie. Having been drafted into the army, that doesn't make you a Nazi. Sixty years after the end of World War II, the accusations caused only a brief stir. The new pope even managed to emerge from the shadow of his predecessor faster than expected. His appearances attracted even bigger crowds than the popular John Paul II. One of the differences between the people who come to see Pope Benedict and the people who came to see John Paul, particularly towards the end, was that many people came to see John Paul, whereas now people come to listen to Benedict. While the people listened to Pope Benedict XVI, not everyone liked what he had to say. Pope Benedict XVI was a reluctant pope. Prior to his election, he had tried to retire, but his predecessor wouldn't hear of it. He tried to leave Rome, but kept getting called back. His papacy seemed somehow inevitable. His religious upbringing, combined with his theological scholarship and faithful adherence to the Christian doctrine, led him right to the Vatican. Someone said to him, hey, you, you worked in the Vatican for 23, 24 years. This must have been an easy transition for you. And he said, no, not really. He said. It was easy to know the doctrine. It's much harder to help a billion people live it. John Paul II was a natural public figure. Wherever he went, he was greeted by huge, adoring crowds. He reached out to young people and established the tradition of the World Youth Days. While Pope Benedict was not the magnetic personality that John Paul was, he too drew huge crowds. In August 2005, only four months after his election, 1.2 million pilgrims gathered in Cologne, Germany to see him. 
how can he be able to behave as John Paul II could in front of 1.5 million young people? It was kind of impossible. But he did it brilliant. He did a real good job. And after that days in, in Cologne, I said, okay, he did it this from, from now on, it will be easy for him. Pope Benedict XVI wanted Catholics to understand and adhere to the fundamental tenets of the Catholic Church. One of his great goals is to reinforce Christian, but specifically Catholic identity. He does not believe that there can be any dialogue, any ecumenical dialogue, any interfaith dialogue, unless Catholics know who they are. And he has very decided and firm ideas about what Catholicism is and who Catholics should be. You can't really have interfaith dialogue if people don't have faith in the first place. He wants to go out, he will present the faith, the basics of the faith, the orthodox, traditional, down-the-line catechism of the faith. If you want to buy into that, great. If you don't, so be it. It's God's will. While Pope Benedict tried to get Catholics back to basics, he managed to offend other Christians. That document on other churches in which he declared them inherently deficient and, and not truly other churches offended, obviously, a lot of Protestants and all non-Catholic Christians. But, you know, the irony is it wasn't aimed at them. It was aimed, at the most, for the most part, at Catholics. He doesn't want Catholics blurring the lines. He doesn't want to think, people to think that the Catholic Church is on equal footing with other churches. His style was that of a professor in the classroom. And as Pope, Joseph Ratzinger didn't abandon his writing. He continued to write articles and books. But as Pope, Joseph Ratzinger faced many challenges. One of the most dire was the priest shortage. No one's found a solution to the problem of the declining number of priests. You can't have mass without priests. It's that simple. Although there were changes he could make in order to attract more priests to the Catholic Church, like allowing women priests or married priests to serve, the Pope was not willing to bend the rules. He also remained steadfast in his position on hot button issues like abortion, divorce, gay marriage, and AIDS. The challenges that faced Joseph Ratzinger, the man and the Pope, were great. But he believed in his mission and found support in God and the faithful. He is thankful and glad to discover that the people support him, that they accept what he says and appreciate what he does, because he not only sees it as a response to his personality, but as a response to the church as a whole. In this respect, the Pope is not a private person, and when the people support the Pope and react positively to him, that also means that they are demonstrating a positive attitude towards the church. As Cardinal, Joseph Ratzinger was often seen as a divisive figure, but as Pope, he hoped to be a symbol of unity. In an effort to turn those hopes into a reality, the Pope made three major trips abroad in 2008, including a historic pilgrimage to the United States to help strengthen the Catholic Church. During the whirlwind six-day visit, he performed a mass in Washington, D.C., visited the White House, and addressed the U.N. General Assembly. The United Nations can count on the results of dialogue between religions and can draw fruit from the willingness of believers to place their experiences at the service of the common good. Of course, getting the public to see the Roman Catholic Church in a better light required the Pope to address the Church's most damaging issue, the sexual abuse crisis. Really, it is a great suffering for the Church in the United States and for the Church in general, for me personally, that this could happen if I read the histories of these of this victims. It's difficult for me to understand how it was possible that priests betrayed in this way their mission to give healing, to give love of the God to these children. We are deeply ashamed and we will do all the possible that this cannot happen in future. He met with victims expressing his remorse for the abuse they suffered. Although for some critics, the conciliatory gestures still weren't enough, the Pope generally received high marks for his efforts in confronting the painful subject.
With a reputation for being a rigid enforcer of the Roman Catholic doctrine, the Pope impressed many Americans with his warm and personable demeanor. On his last day in the States, he made a moving appearance at Ground Zero, meeting with families personally affected by the tragedy of 9-11. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of the earth. Turn to your way of love, those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Later in the day, he celebrated mass in front of nearly 60,000 faithful at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, New York. To this celebration is more than an occasion of gratitude for graces received. It is also summons to move forward with firm resolve to use wisely the blessings of freedom in order to build a future of hope for coming generations. The Pope's U.S. visit was seen as a success, but he still had plenty of work to do in 2008. In July, he visited Australia to celebrate World Youth Day. The biennial gathering created in 1986 by Pope John Paul II was established to bring young people of many different cultures together to celebrate their Catholic faith. Over 200,000 pilgrims from five different continents attended the event. God bless the young people of our world and God bless the people of Australia. In September, he traveled to Paris and said mass in front of 250,000 people. He then continued on to Lord France to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the apparitions of the Virgin Mary to a 14-year-old peasant girl. Besides celebrating the miracle of Lord, the Pope spoke about his desire for the increasingly secular French people to embrace religion. As the year came to a close, Benedict used his papal pulpit to address a less divine yet serious issue, the global financial crisis. He urged the world to unite in authentic solidarity to prevent worldwide disaster. Pope Benedict began 2009 with a controversial decision. He reinstated four bishops who had been excommunicated by Pope John Paul II, including one who was quoted as denying the Holocaust. The revocation was seen as a move on the part of the Pope to bring together traditional Catholics with the more liberal church. But many worried it would threaten the relationship between Catholics and Jews a relationship that Pope John Paul II worked hard to maintain, and one that Benedict promised to continue. The Vatican later released a statement that the Pope would reconsider whether to formally affirm them as full bishops. That same month, Pope Benedict launched his own nonprofit YouTube channel in an effort to reach a younger audience through the latest technology. Now we are ready to produce a regular channel in four different languages on YouTube. His next move was not as well received. While on a pilgrimage in Africa, one of the world's fastest growing regions for the Roman Catholic Church, and where more than 25 million people have died from AIDS, the Pope spoke out on the use of condoms to combat the disease. In a highly criticized statement, he said the distribution of condoms is not the answer and only increases the problem. He later backpedaled, justifying the use of condoms to stop the spread of AIDS in certain cases. It was Pope Benedict's brief stint in the Hitler Youth, as well as his recent public support of church officials who denied the Holocaust, that fueled the controversy surrounding his next trip. During his three-day visit to Israel in May, the Pope made it a point to denounce anti-Semitism and promote peace not only between Christians and Jews, but also throughout the Middle East. I want to make a renewed plea for openness and generosity of spirit, for an end to intolerance and exclusion. No matter how intricable and deeply entrenched a conflict may appear to be, there are always grounds to hope that it can be resolved.
that the patient, persevering efforts of those who work for peace and reconciliation will bear fruit in the end. Concern about Pope Benedict's health was the topic of conversation in July. Following a fall in his room last night, the Holy Father sustained a light fracture of the right wrist. This morning, the Holy Father nonetheless celebrated Mass and had breakfast before being accompanied to the hospital of Aosta, where he was discovered to have a light fracture. The wrist was immediately immobilized. Then, in November, he followed in his predecessor's footsteps and became a recording artist. The album, uh, it's pretty much the album of Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI. It's composed of eight tracks, all of them featuring his voice. A month later, it was back to business for Pope Benedict. In an attempt to mend fences between the Orthodox Russian Church and the Vatican, the Pope met with Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. As a result, they established diplomatic relations and agreed to upgrade Russia's status in the Vatican to embassy level. On Christmas Eve, as devoted Catholics gathered in St. Peter's Basilica to hear Pope Benedict say Mass, the unexpected happened. On his way to the altar, a disturbed woman jumped over a barricade, grabbed the front of Pope Benedict's robe, and pulled him to the floor. Thankfully, the Holy Father was unharmed and able to proceed with the Mass. He later met with the woman, who said she only wanted to embrace him and granted her forgiveness. In May 2010, it was time for Pope Benedict to publicly address the child abuse scandal plaguing the Roman Catholic Church. On a flight to Portugal, the Pope answered heated questions from reporters. The biggest persecution of the Church doesn't come from enemies outside, but is born out of the sins of the Church. There is very great need that it must do penitence and for our sins, and accept purification to seek forgiveness as well as justice. Then, in St. Peter's Square, with close to 15,000 priests in attendance, the Pope begged for God's forgiveness. In September, another scandal rocked the papacy. Italian authorities seized $30 million from the Vatican Bank and placed its two top officers under investigation for money laundering. The Vatican later vowed to be more transparent with their finances so as to avoid any future suspicion. As he celebrated his 85th birthday and seventh year of his papacy in April 2012, speculation grew about Pope Benedict's possible resignation. Appearing frail and tired in recent months and having to use a movable platform to get down the aisle at St. Peter's did little to diminish growing concerns about his health. But Pope Benedict vowed to fulfill his mission as Holy Father. Proving he had the strength to endure, the Pope headed to Lebanon in September to continue his message of peace. What he could not have been prepared for, however, was the personal betrayal he experienced a month later. The Pope's butler, Paolo Gabriele, leaked confidential papal documents and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. A book based on those documents revealed alleged financial mismanagement and corruption within the Vatican. Despite the betrayal, Pope Benedict pardoned Gabriele just weeks into his sentence. If establishing a modern papacy was his objective, Pope Benedict got a little closer to achieving that goal when he sent his first tweet in December. Immediately following the tweet, the Pope rose to over a million followers. In February 2013, Pope Benedict stunned the Roman Catholic Church when he finally announced his resignation becoming the first pontiff to do so in nearly 600 years. The huge weight the Lord put on his shoulders eight years ago when he was elected pope was finally lifted. While Pope Benedict said the reason for his resignation was because he was physically and mentally unable to carry on, during his final days as pope, rumors swirled that the financial and sex abuse scandals played a part in his decision. 
Although he leaves behind a church in crisis, Pope Benedict's legacy is one of success. And as he said goodbye to the papacy and entered retirement, he traded in his infamous red shoes for brown ones and donned the official title, Pope Emeritus. But before his retirement commenced, God's Rottweiler made an historic public farewell. On February 27th, in St. Peter's Square, with thousands hanging on his every word, Pope Benedict XVI addressed his final general audience. I'm not returning to privacy or a life of travel, of meetings, of functions, or of conferences, etc. I'm not abandoning the cross, but will remain in a new way close to the crucified Lord. And on his last day of service, Pope Emeritus boarded a helicopter, flew over Vatican City, and arrived at Castel Gandolfo, the place he would call home. As the world waited for a new pope to be named, the fate of the Roman Catholic Church rested in the hands of 115 cardinals who entered a conclave to elect Pope Benedict's successor via secret ballot. And on March 13, 2013, just in time for the Easter holiday, white smoke billowed from the Sistine Chapel as Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio of Argentina was elected pope. Pope Francis, the name he chose, will now lead the Roman Catholic Church.